Welcome to our first AlmaCast recording and episode of the year. 2024 promises to be an exciting year for the Alma Cafe, the artists who frequent the stage and the patrons who visit. And I, for one, certainly can't wait to see how the year unfolds for Cape Town's premier live music venue. Hope you've enjoyed the first episodes of our podcast series, the AlmaCast, that we introduced during 2023 as a way really to reflect on the history of the Alma Cafe, the personalities behind the venue, the family Tate, and more importantly, the artists who visit and make their magic in the Alma. Last year, we heard from Arno Carstens, from Albert Frost, from John Ellis, and from James Stewart. And it was a great way to reflect on some of the frequent visitors to the Alma space. And hopefully you've had a chance to listen to either one or more of those episodes and we've really worked hard during the festive season to expand the range of podcast platforms that are available. Hopefully you've been able to listen to this episode through a platform of your choice, whether it be Spotify, Spotify for podcasters, Apple Podcasts, which we're now on, or uh, Google, Google Podcasts for that matter. We're keen to see it grow. We're keen to see the reach and the scope of the podcast. Those who we feature on there grow. So please do share and pass on the links if you've enjoyed what you've heard. Let's kick off with 2024 with a bang and a wonderful deep dive with the Von der Boom duo of Sito Otto and Martin Schofield. The two of them had just played a full band show with their other members up in Stellenbosch the night before. I think it had been a big and epic night there before they came through to the Alma to complete what had been a lengthy national tour. Later the evening, after we'd had our conversation and interview, the duo played a stripped down but nevertheless electrifying set had the crowd royally entertained, singing along the one moment and left in stitches of laughter the next. It certainly was a memorable night, hopefully a great baptism for them as their first night at the Alma Cafe. Both Sito and Martin were kind enough to give us an hour and a half of their time, we've edited it down, to this hour-long reflection, to really reflect on a career that now spans almost 30 years, numerous albums, numerous Sama nominations, and reputation as being one of the hardest working and hardest rocking bands in South Africa. I've been listening to Von der Boom's music from the very get-go, the very inception of the band, and this was a real personal treat for me, to speak to two of South Africa's leading and most resilient musicians, to enjoy the fun, the serious ups, and some of the downs of their story. We also conclude the show with one of the tracks from a new album, Hard Mode, that's Misdemeanor, that was played that night, and hopefully indicates not only the new material but also the vibe and atmosphere from a small but nevertheless enthusiastic crowd there at the Alma that night. We certainly will hope it won't be too long before we welcome Sito and Martin, maybe the full band, back to catch up with how they get it going, how their album's been received and as always we hope you enjoy our episode and certainly we'd welcome any feedback or reviews via your respective podcast platforms but in the meantime enjoy the episode, enjoy the company of Martin Sito, Sarah, Jono, and myself, Pete. So it's just gone 3.30, Sunday, the 7th of January, 2024, another year. Here we are at the Alma Cafe with Jono and Sarah. Jono, how are you keeping, mate? How was the festive break? Or did you get a break? Uh, it was festive and not a break, but I'm here. Still, my eyes are open. Things are good. We've made it. <laughs> we survived. Yeah. Well, looking forward to another year at the Alma, my bud, and all the very best to you, the family, Tate. Good luck, and I hope it's going to be a great year for you. Me too. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> Fantastic. And also, to my right here, Sarah, great to welcome you back. How are you keeping? Thanks, How was your festive break? It was fantastic. Do you, you have any nice filet steak anywhere? I did indeed. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Little in-joke there. No, it's yeah. lovely to see you on Boxing Day, Sarah. And we have two guests to welcome us in. Jono, please help us welcome our two guests yeah, for tonight. Will do. I had the honor of meeting and hanging out and even spending a little bit of time on stage last night with Martin Rocker and uh, Sito, the guitarist and singer, respectively, from uh, South African powerhouses, Vonnebohm. Welcome, oh. guys. Woo! Sito, Martin, welcome, yeah. guys. Thank welcome, you welcome. so welcome. much. Thank you. Thank Great you. to be here, man. Thanks for we the introduction. Here in beautiful little spot. Yeah. It is little hair, I Very warned cool. you. <laughs> That's cool. I like little spots. This is your first time here. Uh, I think we were chatting just before we started recording. This is the fir your first time. What's the first impressions of the Alma, guys? Ooh. It feels to me like uh, it could be in middle America somewhere, which is quite cool. 
It's it's different, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's nice and rustic and cool, and it's got character. It's definitely sterile is not a word I would use in here. You know. I don't know what to expect. Um, I've heard so much about Alma Cafe and the kind of performances that happen. And I, for some reason, I thought it was in Oranje Zicht or something like that, like on a corner cafe kind of old vibe. But it's equally as pleasantly surprising. It's cool. You're on tour. You've been heading, you've been working your way down and around and across to Cape Town. Tell us a bit about how the tour has been going. Yeah, we've, we call the tour Coast is Clear. Every year we have a theme for our summer coastal tours and um, we started off in the Eastern Cape and made our way through to the Western Cape and it's just been really really glorious it's been really cool uh, most of the gigs have been packed out and full of uh, enthusiastic fans and new converts and last night was just it was just epic it was like the great way to end off the full band tour it's been really good T tonight it's just the two of you, hey Martin. Are you going to be? This is an acoustic show. Have you been practicing hard, or is it that you you've got your eye in from the full band shows? Man's been shredding a ukulele, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's Yolandi's fault. So she makes me play mini guitars. <laughs> Hurts my hands. Maybe one day I'll get a real size one. Um, yeah, man, love playing. Have we been practicing hard for tonight? Yes, in that we've been on the road, and when we're on the road, we. I love that space. We get into this oiled machine thing. Like even even like breaking down and setting stuff up and that becomes this like super smooth procedure. In terms of the unplugged thing or the duo show, see and myself usually leave it a little bit more open than full band shows in terms of how we interpret the songs, in terms of what songs we're going to do. The repertoire is different. Tonight we'll play stuff that we haven't played on the tour. Nice. We also have the option of throwing in Casino and myself jam together in all the time. So we have the option of throwing in covers. Casino can just call a cover or two out here or there if we want to, or jams or whatever. We can just kind of go off in a very unstructured but structured comfortable space lovely stuff yeah we might even throw in some spanish songs um, el cantante el cantante yes cantante. we, we um, excuse me martin and i are in a side project called el cantante so um yeah we'll see i think uh, as martin said uh, we haven't quite prepared a set list yet but um maybe if i can score a little nap between sound check and when we perform it'll divinely <laughs> inspire <laughs> you know <laughs> It's interesting you talk about the, the people who have been coming to the shows. You've been going now for basically two generations. If you think about it, 96 and various incarnations prior to 96. So you must be now seeing the parents with their kids and, and so forth. Are you seeing that dynamic change as people are growing older and they're bringing their kids and the next generation, the next generation? Is that something you're picking up on in the gigs? So definitely we're in our second generation of fans without a doubt. Fantastic. And in some cases, maybe even thirds with very young kids at the shows. There has always been a very cross section of people at our shows. I think we're a very cross section band. We're not just a rock band. We're not just a this band. We'd, so it's kind of representative in our audience as well. On the notion of what you were talking about, being a, a band that peels sort of cross genre almost one could say. I mean, I know certainly I, I always bristle when people start talking about genre, but I've always felt that the best rock and roll bands are the ones that aren't quite definable as a particular sound and a particular thing and a particular genre, a particular audience, a particular demographic, but they're just a bunch of dudes who play relatively loud music and write great songs and appeal to a lot of people. That to me is kind of where the spirit of rock and roll lives. And that's something like watching you guys last night again, just watching that crowd fucking go moggy for you guys. It was so cool to go like, here's, here's two dudes who've been writing songs together for like two generations, as we say, and appealing right across the board. That's the essence of rock and roll. That's, that's, that's the thing that caught me as a kid, just like trying to get out there and write the songs. And I don't know if I'm anticipating here, but I immediately got curious listening to the two of you guys. How are you still doing it? <laughs> like 30 years in what I dig about watching the two of you interact with one another is you seem to really like one another still like you seem like besties who's still just hanging out on the road and doing the thing 
Is that where it started for you guys? Yeah, I think it's a combination of things. Like the, what you mentioned earlier with regards to not defining ourselves to one particular rock genre, because I mean, rock is so diverse. Mm. And I think that if we had gotten stuck into grunge or new metal or whatever, we would have been fucked. And so, yeah, a combination of, of not just going down one sort of uh, genre style, having individually having diverse tastes in music, um, having lots of crossover and mutual taste in music, and just loving each other as brothers and as friends that just love to create music together and just and perform together. And we we're talking about the different generations that we're experiencing in, in our shows. And it's weird, like we played Brass Bell a, a few days ago, and one of the very first gigs that we did on tour was still as, as Vornaboom, um, was at the Brass Bell in our early, early, early 20s, and we're going on, hanging on, as we still do today. And so it's weird. It's like we're suspended in this time capsule of doing what we do and evolving in our own kind of way, but then the crowds are sort of growing with us and new generations are coming in, and thankfully we're not stuck to a certain genre so that we can be adaptable and mold and evolve and grow. Uh, like Sila said, in our own personal tastes, we've always been quite different in Vornaboom, but there's a lot of crossover bands that we, we're, we've all been into, okay. or a lot of influences that we're all into, but then such diversity uh, amongst us. And as, uh, I mean, amongst me and Sila, we listen to really in our own personal time, like over the years, completely different stuff. But there's a huge crossover section the gray area that moves in between the black and white area of Sido and myself, that's a huge crossover circle yeah. of, of music that, that we can speak to each other and go, I'm talking about X. Uh, and it's ah, like, gotcha. I know that sound. I know what you're yep. after. Also, Sido and myself, and I consider this, and I've, I've thought about this a lot over the last few years, the older I get, the more gratitude I feel, the more, even more I appreciate having a partner like Cedo to write songs with. Oh, yeah. So, like, Cedo's solo stuff is very different to Vornaboom stuff. My solo stuff is very different to Vornaboom stuff. It is the magic between the two of us that creates that sound. Yeah. And because we know that, because we've experimented completely on our own <laughs> and it sounds nothing like Vornaboom. Yeah. If we're left to our own devices. So it truly is a mixture of those two minds that makes that music. Yeah. And I consider myself extremely lucky that I've still got that partner to do that with. And it's not just like a business thing. Like, oh, I must hang with this guy because we make a fucking fortune because we fucking don't. We've heard this song before. So, <laughs> so business partner is not, not so much, but creative partner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like, actual, like soul food <laughs> partners. So like, and I, know, yeah. I know from a lot of bands it's a business thing. It's a corporate world yeah, once yeah. they get somewhere. With us, it's never been. It's still just been family and, and what we want to do. And again, having that respect for each other to go, here's my idea. Oh, cool. Well, here's my idea. Well, that's not a vulnerable idea or that is. What can we do with this to make it our idea? And anyway, the long and short of it is that, that we're very lucky that we work very well together and have this have this very free-flowing relationship. There's very little or n n no animosity between Sula and myself. We can tune each other anything, anything. And how did you guys first find one another? Because you're Dacha. from England. Oh, well, fair enough. <laughs> There's a surprise. And you're from America. You found, or well, half from America, and you find yourselves in South Africa, and then what? Like you shared a joint outside, yeah, like outside Hell's Kitchen club. or some That's shit. That's exactly what it was. We shared a joint outside a club called Tattoos. In, in Ramburg. In Ramburg in 1993 in the parking lot in his fucking pirate shirt. <laughs> yeah. I was, I, was in a, I was in like a goth rock band called Moonchild. And Martin was in the eight-legged groove machine. With Wade. With Wade. Wade. Bass player. And we, we were on the same bill. And it was the first time we'd met. And I saw, I saw eight-legged groove machine perform and I was completely blown away because they can play. They can play their instruments. Like Martin, from the first moment I met him he was already a, a, a like there's a fucking guitar player yeah he was yeah. already he was already I'd rocking what yeah. he does now then yeah you know? <laughs> and i was just like blown away and gobsmacked at the talent at the young age and all that stuff and yeah and then after the gig 
we like obviously shared a joint and we started talking about our favorite bands and you know chili peppers and stone roses and the cult and like all of this stuff and then six months later i don't know if i got hold of wade or if wade got hold of me but i needed a band and they needed a vocalist and then i joined the eight-legged groove machine okay it was it was quite wild cedo's band because cedo's brilliant he had a cuck band. He was a great singer. And we had a shit singer and a great band. We were like, it's written in the stars. <laughs> oh, that's funny, man. That's so cool. That kind of origin story, like divine intervention and just everything working and flowing and like 28 years down the line or 30 years down the line, whatever it is, here you guys are still having a laugh about it. This is when you know there's forces out there bigger oh, than you. 100%. Like just at work that you just fuck all you can do about it. It just is what it is. <laughs> yeah. It was such an interesting time. I've said it so many times on this platform. You know, I came in 94, August, September, and having left the UK, Oasis were going through the roof there. You've mentioned the roses. And I'd seen all that go through. I've been in, living in Manchester at that stage. Music was such a big part of my identity and coming to South Africa. What was amazing was sort of transitioning into what was clearly a burgeoning and growing music scene i missed the whole afrikaans movement but don't worry you missed fuck all <laughs> but you know yourselves the the nude girls that whole sugar drive thing that was going to have been part of that and to have gone through that quick transition from you say eight-legged groove machine into i think electric pedals and then through to the wonderboom what were your earlier memories of of, of that Time. I mean, 5FM, clearly a big thing at that stage. You know, Barney Simon, uh, <laughs> bow down to that guy in terms of what he was doing for South African music. But at what stage did you transition from, this is great and it's a lach and we found a good blend to, this is what we're going to do and we're going to do it for 27 years and counting. Well, that was never, a, ever a conceived or preconceived idea that we'd be doing it this long. We had no idea. Or that we'd be alive. For, yeah, Even, this. yeah, the way we carried on in the early days, we're actually lucky yeah. we still, yeah, 30 years, almost 30 years later. But from, from my side, all I want to say about that thing, in the early 90s, there was a brand new country with a brand new government. There was brand new hope and a brand new outlook. And we were suddenly, it was like, it was like we'd been given the keys to the fairground. We could say what we wanted, we could do what we wanted, we could look how we wanted, we could take a crowd by the scruff of the neck and say anything to them without the fear of any kind of repercussion from anyone. We were absolutely completely free. There was a massive flow of information suddenly in the country. Things had opened up, music, we could get movies, magazines, whatever you wanted. It just opened wide open. Then there was the drug scene that opened wide open and came with a rave thing which was brand new for us then as well. And so when we were in our early days, as a rock band, we were fighting the whole rave scene as well. So everyone just wanted to take pills and go, and we were trying to play like this cool funky rock music for people, you know. We kind of felt a little bit up against it, but we never felt like we'd do anything else as such. We were just on our, we were on our mission. And we always, the uh, last thing I'll say on that, we, we have been and always have been a band in our own lane, running our own race. Hence, like Sila says, we've never been, oh, grunge is trendy, oh, new metal's trendy, oh, this is beard and banjos are trendy, whatever, fuck, we've never done that thing, you know? Sito, your, oh, your, your memories of that amazing time, and of course, having come, Zero. <laughs> having come with from the, the States <laughs> where these issues of censorship and so forth would have been far less of an issue, coming to South Africa and then finding your group. Well, I mean, tell us a bit about that. A precursor to those days uh, in high school, you know, finding my identity coming from, as you say, the completely different culture of living in New York City. And then everything sort of like compartmentalized and, you know, everybody's finding their identity. And then I'm always going through a transition change period from high school, moving from place to place. And then when, we st when I started to get into music, I took up the bass guitar because a couple of friends of mine started a band and they had enough guitarists and everything else. And I was like, well, then let me take up bass. And that ended up being my first instrument. And then once that bug bit and I started learning to play and read and all that stuff, then it was just like not looking back. You know, that was my mission. And when I hooked up with the eight legged groove machine, it was perfect because we were all on the same wavelength. And from listening to Barney Simon on 5FM, 
at that time when I'd left school, I was doing photography and printing and all that. And I'd be sitting, uh, sitting up all night doing black and white printing and listening to Barney's show and listening to all the bands that he would be playing. It was like, it was like a dream of mine to eventually be on radio. And when it finally happened, then it was just very quick. You know, that whole transition from eight-legged right up until Vornaboom. Well, for me, it felt like it was quite, looking back, it was quite quick and quite intense. And then it's just about keeping that pitch going, <laughs> you know, since that. So, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's um, to be, it's just such a privilege to be part of that explosion that happened with Nude Girls, Sugar Drive, Squeal. Um, B World was sort of ending and, and uh, Straw Belly and all. But I mean, there were so many great bands that came out from that scene, you know. End, endless list. I mean, really. Yeah. The transition from, I'm going to call it a garage rock or whatever it was, as in, you know, you're making your noise, you're finding your feet, identity to the recording studio. And then working with producers at some stage. I think some of your first stuff was self-produced, but ultimately, I think the last one you've done with Fink and Co. I mean, it's been an interesting journey, and that must have been quite a, a learning curve, yeah? Our very first album was Is It? And Is It was recorded in downtown studios in Joburg after hours because we couldn't actually afford the studio. We couldn't afford the studio at the time. So we got an engineer mate of ours there to sneak us in at night. We used some secondhand tapes as well, because tapes were a fortune back then as well, because we were recording directly to, to tape back then. We, we had no idea what we were doing, as, as most people do in the first time in the studio. I think we were all of like, I don't know, I was 21, you were like 20 at the time or something. And we were suddenly like in this like studio environment with these dudes who had produced, like Peter Paulson, who had produced some stuff for Peter Gabriel when he was here. Everyone, he'd produced like Johnny Clegg. And he'd, he'd, so we were just like these irritating lighties to him, like, let's tell you how the music industry is going to work and we'll show you how to record and this is what we want to do. And he was like, nah, yeah, all right, whatever. You know, he was actually quite cool with us. He just pretty much let us do what we wanted to do to a point. Anyway, we got the first album done and there wasn't much of a, they're like Cito says, it happened pretty quickly for us to a point, sure. which was... That very first album, Is It, only had six songs on. We used to release kind of EPs back in the day and just release what you wanted. And then we got a call from our manager the one night going, um, guys, uh, I've just had the nominations for the 1996 South African Music Awards and you guys are in the best rock category. We were like, what? No way. We were like, that's impossible. Like we were the complete outsiders, like completely outside. And then, yeah, who won it? Sugar Drive or Nude Girls? Yeah, probably. It was sugar, Nude Girls, I think, or Sugar Drive. Your or memory's or better than mine, yeah. so I'll anyway. go with whatever you say. Uh, <laughs> what I'm saying is it happened pretty quickly for us where suddenly we became more prominent in the scene. 5FM was fully supportive of a lot of that scene back in the day, which really helped because it was terrestrial and, and national radio. But yeah, we were pretty much just like musos completely. I mean, I... Downtown Studios, I was actually working as an assistant engineer, which is how we got in. Right. But I was still learning, so I knew nothing about the recording process or producing or anything like that. So we trusted the professionals to do it, and we would just go in and do our parts, and then they'd kick us out and carry on mixing and schnoffing, whatever they were doing. And, yeah, we ended up with a result. And throughout the years, like as we go into every new recording process we would learn a little bit more about it. And uh, we got to a point where we were eventually just self-producing and still learning um, and then just working with our means, you know. And now what we do is uh, in the songwriting process, we treat it as a pre-production process. So we just, we get, the po we get the songs to a point where we think we're like, it's pretty much CD ready in production. And then we go into studio and Matthew Fink does his magic and we get to nitpick even more. So the process is a lot more meticulous and a lot more defined. And we spend a lot of time in mixes, a lot of time in recording, getting the sources right, re-recording, trying things out, changing arrangements, adding stuff, taking things out. It's like it's be it's become a lot more elaborate now where in the very beginning we just go in there and do like one or two takes and then you know, and then just trust the guys to put it all together. We, we've become far more meticulous. I think as both of us who have studios as well, you start learning that game and then you really know what you want. It's not just a case of going, set your amp up, green light goes on and or red light goes on and you play. It's far more in-depth and involved. 
nowadays for us. But those first ones, there's, cert- there's a lot of magic in just slap dash recording if you get it right. Like I always use Elvis's blue suede shoes for an example. That was the second take done on a Tuesday afternoon. It was on the radio that night because it's straight to wax back in the day. Like they recorded and it's straight to wax. That's how it was, you know. And there's magic in those recordings. Just as an example, speaking about quick recordings, Charlie, which is one of our biggest of hits, which is someone else's song, that was done literally on a Friday afternoon in four hours in the one, studio, one take. Yeah, one vocal take between the two of us still learning the lyrics in the same booth, just one take, which we thought was just going to be scratch vocals. And David Gresham was like, no, send it out. That was a, a Trevor Redman rabbit cover. And that literally was on a Friday afternoon and Gresham came in there as we were laying down the scratch vocals and he was like, cool, we've got it. And we were like, no, 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 no. This is, we just, this is a demo. Like he was like, no, 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 I can hear, that's fine. Send it out. And then Sunday night I heard it on the radio for the first time. That's it seems to be something of a habit of yours though, hey? Taking, and taking songs the habit. and oh, just uh, absolutely like <laughs> taking them completely different places. Yeah, it's, what it's, were we it, talking about it's, last it's, night? Mendoza's shit? Mendoza, yeah, yeah. Oh, Charlie's, cool. Charlie's riff is a full Mendoza ripoff. Hey, thanks, Mendoza. Bro, it's wild. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so we, we've taken a lot of liberties over the years. And the, the cover versions we have done, people accept them as our songs, which is quite amazing because you own them then, you know? But it's been a blessing and a curse for us. Because the fact of the matter is those aren't our songs. Johnny's Africa. I mean, to me, that is, that's the definitive version in my book of that song. Well, thank I you. Mean, I, I, think, yeah. I think of a lot of people, our version of Africa and Charlie are the versions. Mm. Africa was never a famous song for Johnny Clegg. Interesting. Until we'd done it. And we've actually got the email from him. Really? Lovely. Yeah, oh, for his, that he sent to Gresham back in the day saying, cool, thanks very much. And you guys are welcome to... Because to, we actually said, can we, can we cover the song? Mm. You know, as a politeness, yeah. it's public domain, C- so you can cover it. You know, it's but we add out of politeness. We hopefully, were like, hopefully that email and he coming was like, back was a "You're welcome," not a "Like what the fuck you boys." No, <laughs> he, he was. He was like, "Cool, you guys go for it." And then when we sent him the original version, he was like, "That's awesome." And then uh, we saw him a while later, and he said he'd included it in his live shows again. That's oh, brilliant. I didn't amazing. know that's a lovely story. He did a newer version of Africa. So he took the same chorus from the original version of Africa, which had uh, Sipum Chunu. I think it was like mm. more driven by him. And he had done a, a, like a whole different take on Africa. So he reinvented it for himself uh, with Juluka. Really cool sort of darker lyrics in the verses and like almost sounds like the police or whatever, you know, like very, very cool. So when I had to cover, they did like a Johnny Clegg tributes, not last year, the year before, which they invited me to sing on. And they asked me to cover that, but it had to be Johnny's version of Africa, which is the second version. And I got to get my teeth into that and learn that. And it's, it's quite beautiful what, what music does, you know, it, besides connecting, it's like, it's, they're like forms of life that just grow and evolve and are interchangeable and always open for interpretation and you could breathe new life into these songs you know it's quite beautiful you in particular i think sito took that uh, route with abyssinth that series of covers that you did and the oh shows yes. with paul flynn and paul flynn and, and, from sugar i mean Man, that was yeah. that was really special and I th- i'm assuming that what you were covering was very much the songs that had influenced the very and, and it's such a diverse palette of tunes that you covered there but is that something that somewhere along the line you you may look to to uh, you were saying you've got, each got side projects you've got your solo stuff you've got the new album coming out which we'll talk about just now but that whole absinthe that, that's a very special thing to me i've got the cd but i was like when do i get to see this no nah, cool um <laughs> yeah so absinthe is a full-on a self-indulgent project and whenever paul and i get our shit together we are going to record again Perfect. there's a few songs that we haven't recorded yet and we always try to add new songs to our repertoire and it's it's that fine line of not being too indulgent you know like you have your favorites from a certain band but not everybody might know the band or their, their sort of lesser known songs. So like, we, like your Gomez, for example. Like Gomez, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we got to see them, got to see Gomez live when we went to the UK. Uh, wow, you, I would give my left arm to oh, see Fantastic. That. Man, that's, that's one of those crossover bands that we were all like, yeah, Gomez. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, to me, that's the best. Since I've been here 30 years, that's the band I really, really would have loved to have seen. Yeah, we saw them on the last night of their British tour in 2004 at the London Forum in Cam in North London, almost Camden, yeah. Awesome. North London it was killer. 
sang every word, hollered every riff back at them. It was wonderful. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to, it's definitely on the cards. The, the thing with having the various projects is that certain bands take precedent and then the ones that aren't that busy get the you know back burner kind of a thing. But it'll happen again soon. Once once we get the new album out, I've got a Blood Honey album coming out as well. So it's all on the cards. Who makes the call? Who goes, yo guys, Vonnebohm time again? It's always Vonnebohm time. Yeah, Vonnebohm is always, it, it, is always the sort of priority. And, and we're constantly writing and, and getting together. So when we get to a point of like, okay, we're ready to, to actually now start... Uh, consolidating the songs and focusing on deadlines and let's get an album out in the new year or you know and we have band meetings about it and stuff like that as well but if you're looking for the uh, the sergeant major it's martin 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 drives us to make sure that we don't fuck around and waste time and you know he must be a very overworked guy <laughs> sergeant schofield they, they, they hate sergeant me schofield. i don't consider myself like any kind of musical director or band leader or anything like that it's just i'm the drill sergeant that's all i'm just the guy who shouts the instructions they come from the top have you got the loudest voice and i've got the, i'm the most irritating loudest voice got the loudest amp as well i also right? used to have the biggest <laughs> muscles and i'm just old and skinny <laughs> <laughs> well that was always an important thing for von der Boom, as i remember yeah <laughs> tell us about about this new album then Obviously, you're doing the tour. I'm assuming you've played a few of the new tunes on that and how those have gone down with the fans. And tell us a bit about your hopes and expectations around the album and what people would, should expect for it. The new album, um, it's always a pleasure for us recording. It's always a pleasure for me. Like anything I do involved in this live or recording or whatever, it's just a pleasure for me. I don't consider this work or hard work or whatever. When I hear musicians complaining, I want to fucking slap them. I'm like, you've got the fucking easiest job in the world. You go around playing your own shit for people. They give you free food and booze. The guy who's paying you for the night wants to get you fucking hammered. And <laughs> for free. <laughs> for free. And you're going to travel in the best things and stay in the best rooms and that. And get paid. And people are going to clap at you all night, every three minutes. What the fuck do you want? <laughs> like, that's the best thing you could ever have. Anyways. So that, no matter what area of it is for me, I, I get upset when people are like, oh, it's so hard because it's fucking not. But it, it's hard to keep the fire burning. That's what's hard is to keep the level, the kind of the sprint or the, the pace up. That's what's hard. Also, what the fuck do you say after 10 albums in 28 years? What the fuck have you got to say for yourself? And if you think about it, you're like, um... Uh, I don't know what to say. Oh, and my then, back. Oh, I'm fucking knackered, man. I've had enough. Love, where's me brandy? Um, we well, think hopefully there's been some sort of human development over 28 years. <laughs> what? No yeah. ways. We're still 16 nah, in our brains. Goodness. What do you mean? <laughs> so anyway, the, the album and the music and everything is, is part of our development. It's part of how we move. It's not like, okay, now's album time. Now's this, whatever. Uh, the new album, Mr. Mean, is the first single off it, and we've been playing it for the last, what, quite five a few months, months now, yeah, already? We've months. been, like, breaking it in. Uh, we often find to break songs in live. We're not one of those bands who are like, let's save it till the album's out like a big surprise. We, like, get it out there, road test it, see what your reaction is right there, and then, bef and then you might even decide that's not going on the album. We have a lot of songs like that. If we've written, we've gotten to a certain point, maybe even recorded, and then they they just don't crack the nod for the album or whatever but uh so it's a it's a, like this ongoing organic process of writing recording and then just putting it all together and also creating while we're in studio so that's also like we get a certain number of songs going and then while we're in those sessions then we'll be inspired for other songs and pull out some other stuff and then develop those so it's an ongoing process the album's going to be called hard mode it's for numerous reasons but it seems to be, it seems to wait, be... Wait, 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 <laughs> You want that explanation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm it's, stuck there. It's so, it's so, it's weird. Like when we mentioned the title of the album... It's multidimensional. We, Give we, me one explanation. Okay, one, one, one is one that... Reason. Okay, so something that we do sometimes, uh, like just before we rehearse or something, or in the middle of rehearsal, we'll go and, and, and have a joint and then we come back and we try to rehearse and it's so fucking hard. Like my vocals are all over the place. We forget arrangements and we call it hard mode. Or if we've got to go and do a mission 
And then we, uh, and I, I do that often as well in my own capacity. I'll, I might have a, a, a scafe and then I have to go on mission and I've just made it harder for myself. So it's kind of like gaming where you select like easy mode, you know, normal You've mode, just completed mode. medium mode, now it's time yeah, for Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so that's, what, that's where it originated from. So this is basically choose your own adventure and you choose the hard mode. Hard mode, hard mode. exactly. Right. The past, li past, the past less traveled. <laughs> <laughs> so in many ways, like I've, I've been sort of appreciating the, um, the sort of holistic meaning behind it. Just living can be hard mode, you know, just like trying to, just hustling and trying to survive. Or if you're striving to be a really good person, spiritually or morally or whatever, you know, with other people, there's more suffering attached to it. I've been doing lots of yoga and all sorts of stuff. So there is merit and not just living an easy life, you know, there's, there's merit in like doing the struggle. If I take you back to a period that was, I think, a struggle for particularly musicians, that COVID period, and I went, you know, did a bit of a YouTube browse before today, and I see, you know, you did some of the various live shows, web streaming, you did some of the, what was it, the Corona sessions, you, there was, there's a whole lot of stuff there. Can you talk a bit about that period and how things may have changed, or things that you've adapted, whether it's the whole online sharing of, of stuff or communication, how, has that... Has in many respects, a longer term benefit than that hard yards up front that you must have gone through? I personally don't feel any super positive benefit mm. or change from it since, mm. since COVID. Personally, I feel like the music industry or the entertainment industry has taken more of a battering mm. since then. Mm. In this country, for example, there's less venues to play. People are quite happy getting Mr. D watching Netflix and staying at home, which the, the whole pandemic thing reinforced nicely for people. Don't worry, you can chill at home. Don't go anywhere. You'll be fine, you know. In terms of us personally, in terms of, of me personally, and the whole world, I think it was pretty tough. But there's two songs on the new album, besides the other stuff, but two songs that came out of hard lockdown, which were quite dark songs for us, but... And so it's a direct representation. One of them was Prodigal Son, the other one was Rabbit Hole. Rabbit Hole is one of our darkest tracks. I'm just going to hear standing up on my arms talking about it. That period was, was quite heavy. Um, we've never been a dark band and we've never written much dark stuff. But on this new album, there's a lot more dark uh, lyrical tinges and uh, entering into subjects that are a little more dark than we've never entered into before. Which makes me very happy. <laughs> back, back to the gothic days of Randberg <laughs> and even down to some musical choices on the album chords and it's very rare you'll find a straight four chord Vonneboom song that's just a straight chord four chord song we have those and our, I'm not saying our songs are complex but there's always got to be something in there something that's not stock standard one of the first songs that we recorded for this album with Just Music and Matthew Fink it's called Voodoo Doll. We kind of feel that that brought on COVID. Because right after we released it, then everything just went for a ball of shit. The first time we played that song live was at a, the Halloween before 2019. And <laughs> we were all dressed up and everything was crazy. And it was a semi-outdoor gig and the skies just opened and just ra like completely drenched all of our gear. Within the first few notes of Voodoo Doll. Yeah, and then we couldn't play the rest of the gig. It actually ruined our equipment and everything else. And then thereafter, like Wade, our bassist, he was like, I don't know, I'm afraid to play that song. It's like, <laughs> it's like guys, what are we, like, this is like serious voodoo vibes. We're like, and then COVID <laughs> happened, and we're like, Jesus. So we haven't, we kind of feel responsible for So COVID. you're going to play that tonight? <laughs> no. First try. Have you guys played it since? Or just like we played it a couple of times. Okay. It's such and, a great... anything eerie? No. So we, we played it... So it was uh, like a one and done. No, we had shit happen. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, more, more than not. So, but the last time we played it, uh, which is like about a year and a half ago... We played it again, we just dug it up. We did like a very indulgent three hour show with like all of our friends. The show is called High Friends in Places. And then we did that song and the place was pumping to that song. They loved it. It's, it's like a real alternative dance floor track. But yeah, we haven't played it again, so. It's because of Wade, he's very scared of it. <laughs> <laughs> he's not here tonight. <laughs> Music is so woven into the fabric of your lives and who you are as people. 
there's this idea of like, oh, we're a band and we get together and we do band things and then we go on tour and we record. And, and it's just like, no, you guys just wake up and like think of hanging out together. And mostly what that happens to involve is like, you know, Martin will pick up a ukulele and Sita will have a melody in his head or they'll come up with like a hook. But it's just like, abso- I mean, it sounds stupid to say the word lifestyle. But like that's exactly what it is. It is. There's no thought of like, oh, we're musicians and therefore we have to do that. It's like, oh shit, oh yeah, we musos. Oh yeah, fuck, we gotta go at like every now and again do an interview, <laughs> you know. But like, it's just the whole life is around experiencing a thing and then writing a song about it, like and causing COVID, like <laughs> by stealth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For me, what what's so cool, like as a, as like obviously a, a young muso looking up to to some some real cool dudes, is you started out just kind of winging your way through it and you just that's who you are as people there's no artifice and bullshit and rock star crap here it's just your people who play music which is the best kind you know as far as that rock star thing goes and i can safely say this i don't speak for cedar ever but i safely say for the two of us we've never bought into that shit yeah, we don't we don't buy into that thing and we don't buy our own hype you must let other people buy your hype let other people suck your cock don't suck your own <laughs> I think that's some of the best advice I've ever heard. Mark. I mean, Thanks. if you could, you would never leave your house. So. I'd never leave my bedroom. <laughs> there we go. But there's always Netflix, remember? <laughs> in the background. <laughs> but in terms of, uh, you're talking about, John, you're talking about lifestyle, honestly. Like, for me, I always say to people, I mean, we have friends and we were with some of them the other day and we, we both have friends and family who are, who are very wealthy from what they've done and how successful they've been and whatever. And we've been successful up to a point and this and then the other. But it's about lifestyle. For the last 25 years, like I haven't woken up with an alarm clock. That's Yeah, you can really me. speak for yourself there. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't sat in traffic ever. Oh, well, I have. But you do. But, but I mean, I, 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 it's five days a week. There's certain things like that besides music, but it's like just for me, how do you live day to day? And that's it. Like, because this is not a fucking rehearsal. Yeah. This is it. This is what you get. You must smash it. I love Every that. day. We might make it look easy and like, ah, we just wake up and we're just musos. But the struggle is real. And, you know, when you got bills to pay and you and you married and you have kids and you still got to pick up dog poops and buy dog food and like, it becomes part of your thing. It's still a privilege for me to be doing purely music as my job. And what all does that look like? What does an average week in the life of Sito look like? It's varied. So there's no set thing. Because I've got multiple music projects that sort of keep me busy, where one sort of wanes in busyness, then the other will pick up. Uh, As you mentioned, musical theater. uh, There was a a stage where I was doing it. Jesus Christ Superstar, um, we got to tour it in Greece and South Korea and did it a couple of times in South Africa. And that was quite a an experience on its own. I learned so much from it. Mm. It was quite nice having a regular gig between six to eight shows a week and having that kind of routine going. It's a thing, hey, the professionalism in the musical theater world Mm. versus the wild lands that we occupy as live musicians. Yeah, 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 it's quite a big difference. A huge difference. And I learned so much from it. Like, first of all, I got to focus on my vocals. That's take them a little bit more seriously. I learned a lot of sort of warm-ups and techniques to preserve and to open and to push my vocals a little bit more. And and then just the whole concept of how everybody works as a team to put on a show, to tell yep. a story. So there was lots of benefits from that. But I don't really do that anymore these days. I do music direction for corporate events. Okay, cool. So that's, that helps with finances. The bills, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I started my own coffee brand called CETA 1974, which I'm looking at developing over the next few years. So yeah, that's kind of like how we keep music uh, as my lifestyle. Yeah, front and center all the time. That's really cool. I like, sorry, I, I'm getting a little nerdy about the music theater stuff because I've done some as well, so I can really relate to it. And then as somebody who's also like delved into the world of being a professional singer, it's the most terrifying thing in the world, isn't it? Like wake up with the cold and be fucked. <laughs> yeah. It, like how do you how do you deal with that? Yeah, so like it's those extremes of like having the ultimate calling or job in the world and feeling like God to getting sick and like completely losing your mojo mm. and feeling like 
a worthless piece of shit because without your voice, you're nothing kind of a thing, you know? Totally. It's a, yeah, it's a, it can be a, quite a battle. But, you know, that whole thing, I think, is also, if you do it for long enough, it develops you and prepares you for hard times. Yeah. I got to say, just on that one, guys, you want to hear, hear this man sing a, sing a hell of a vocal uh, that you two job you guys did last night oh man slam that out of the park dude and like bono is not an Thank easy you. man to cover like wow i Genuine. have to be honest though like yeah. the only reason why we covered that song was we a couple of months back we did a vulnerable boo collaboration yeah that and, was up in um, joburg it's on it huh? and because you two uh, was such an influence on my formative years mm -hmm. uh they were like my window drug band because I, I grew up with gospel and classical and all that. And because they were kind of still kind of Christian, I started listening to them, and then that just blew up my world. And so they were such a... Bono's voice and his style wow. of singing and their music, such a huge influence. And because of that, I avoided doing those covers because it was just that we were too close. Bit, yeah, okay. And then Chris Chameleon is like, well, you know, what cover should we do? I like the 80s. And it's like, if you were to mention a song from the Joshua Tree, I, I, I basically know that album back to front. And I was like, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Brother. So I'm like, let's do it. And I was like, fuck, let's do it. And then, and then when I presented it to the guys, they were like, okay. And then once everybody got their teeth in, they're like, yeah, this is a pumping well, song. You know? U2's incredible. So I, hate the, I hate the U2 hate. I feel like Martin's just picked up his microphone and is about to slam this. I am but one of those people. I, I don't get the hype. I'm really? sorry. It's the same with Radiohead. Tom York oh is so whiny. I oh can't do it. Okay, you're Sarah. Me. Oh, you're killing me. <laughs> I've got one Radiohead song I like. The rest can get fun. Which one is it? Fake Plastic Trees. Which song did you play last night? <laughs> before, before, before we Where the streets have no name. Where the streets, great song. Yeah. Oh, good, good guitar a, part as well. Song. Yeah, and you nailed the, like that edgy stuff as well. It was so cool. Even cool. On, so, a, on a Les Paul, huh? So the first time, only on a Les Paul. Yeah, yeah. First, time, <laughs> first, time we, first time we did it in Pretoria at the beginning of December with Boo, I remember just looking across the crowd and there was, there was people in tears at the end of that song. I was like, Jesus, this is powerful for people like the average white person is like wow yeah yeah i know it's definitely average white person <laughs> midlife kind of age in uh, fairness bang, like, average middle of the road stuff yeah. did you <laughs> did you guys watch did you guys go and see you two when they were here yeah twice yeah yeah so both both tours okay yeah. so i got to see the 360 tour and and i had the same because i grew up listening to you two as well and i think my dad just was playing it in the in the house one day and i was like fuck that's so cool pride was the one for me you know where he oh goes up and he hits true, that true. the way the way his voice changes between the two high notes he sings the operatic style and then he just mm -hmm. opens up and it gets all up oh kills uh -huh. me even now and then i got to see the the 360 tour and, and the gig they did at the cape town stadium we happened to be in a good sound spot. The Edge wasn't having the best day. His his wireless rig conked out. But Bono was in full fettle. And mm -hmm. I, I just, I mean, they started singing. Uh, even now, thinking about it, I still think, having seen Bruce Springsteen, you know, which is like a juggernaut truck hitting you in the face, having seen like Muse, which was my favorite band, at the top of their game, when they were down here, you two still the best fucking gig I've ever seen in my life, you know. And Counting Crows is the second. The first time I saw the Counting Crows also lost my mind. But you two came on and they started playing, and it was just like <laughs> tears immediately. Like couldn't help myself. So you know, for me, like, my my passion for you two starts with the first album up until Pop, and then thereafter they they basically they were just they should have just stopped. But <laughs> performance wise, like the shows that they put on. I was a heavy U2 head, like Joshua Tree, Rattle and Hum. Those albums were heavy formative. And if you listen back to them, they're still fucking killer songs. There's so many great, like, yeah. it's ridiculous. And then as far as Radiohead is concerned. <laughs> I feel like I'm about, about to get a your Radiohead, you're going to get bollocked. Yeah, we no, did not forget. I can't wait. No, 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 it's cool. I'm not going to say anything. Uh, no, it's cool. <laughs> I love them so much. They are... They're my one bucket list band that I have to see before really? I die. Really? Yeah. If you give them the time of day and you find out how they recorded their albums, like each of those album sessions, the way they approach things, they're always trying to break the molds. They just were tired of being the standard, conventional, typical rock band and 
because for them it's also just like why bother you well, know they like got why, that right. why huh? they, they got, got that, that right yeah. <laughs> but then they play everything so everything they experiment they're like an experimental art rock band so everything that they record and create that's as unique as you're going to get they'll then learn how to play these things live and then they kick ass live when they play these yeah. things so anyway I've, i have a huge passion for they, they certainly came a long way from creep big time i mean amazing even, diversity yeah. in the yeah. way they big time oh i'm gonna nerd out so hard if we dive into radiohead now guys but so so there's two things i want to say because for me radiohead is johnny greenwood's band like that's that how that's how it works um and and you think about like okay why was creep huge Right, that's what set the whole thing up. Just that ridiculous Marshall Shredmaster noise, and then what they do live. Everyone's recording loops and sending them to Johnny, and he just like drops them in when he feels like it. Three songs down the line, they're all just composing live on stage, like sending shit to him via yeah. MIDI. He listens. He's listening to like a celestial composition in the sky while the rest of the band's playing Radiohead songs and he'll just chuck their loops in when he thinks it's appropriate. It's mind-bending stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's another level. But let's yeah. not waste our time on Radiohead. In this no shame. They've, they've done all right without us. <laughs> <laughs> you guys mentioned you both have studios, yeah? Yeah. Does that change the game a little bit about like, okay, recordings are self-financed, self-produced. We don't need to stress so much about trying to make money off our recordings. They can be a business card now. That's what I always say. They're a damn expensive business card, our recordings. But because we both have the luxury of doing that, that's why we can have the luxury of spending more time on our recordings. When we're in our first couple of albums, the first time you'd actually hear the stuff yourself is when it was recorded. Yeah. And nowadays we have the luxury of like going downstairs in either of our houses and going, um, I've got this idea, oh, what do I need? I need a tabla on this, import a sample, and uh, it'd be great if I had a, a double bass on here and a drum loop and uh, blah, 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 boom. Ah, that's the picture I wanted. Here you yeah. go. Have a look at this picture. What do you think? Whereas before, especially for me, I'm quite descriptive, so I'd, find, I'd often find myself describing stuff to the band. Like, it's got to be like, kind of like this. But with this sound and like uh, I'm looking at this kind of a uh, vision, or now I can just go here. Yeah, listen. You must hear when Cito tries to tell me an idea with his nose boxing. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard of beatboxing. Cito nose boxes ideas. <laughs> <at me. laughs> please, please indulge go, us. Go on, Cito, give us one. We shouldn't even be talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a secret. Certain things that are best left off airways. <laughs> Again, I can't yeah. leave shits alone. So <laughs> please nose box. I can we, can we just have a little bit of it? Just say uh, just this much. Yeah, yeah, are, are you going to put down a basic? <laughs> walks around the house making coffee, or the studio all day going. Man, okay, oh, so come on, let me shot. I have this like, it's a weird habit that I have because um, music's always going on in my head, and I usually when I think of new songs, I think in bass lines, <laughs> but then you know rhythm and, and so uh, it needs to be accompanied by something, and so I have lots of voice notes on my phone with like. <laughs> <laughs> and then my wife just laughs at me like you're so weird this man. is by far my favorite part of the entire podcast <laughs> <laughs> and there you have the secret of the success of von der Boom. brilliant so as we start a wrap up guys you've got the show tonight really looking forward to seeing the show looking forward to hearing some of the old stuff some of the new and some of the covers and, and some of your solo stuff. When does the album come out? And what can people expect in terms of Vonnebuum for the year ahead if people are listening to this in Josie and Derbs or wherever? What else is coming, guys? Hard Mode, the new album will be out. We were looking at the end of Jan. Realistically, chatting on this tour, it's going to be end of Feb. But yeah, end of Feb, Hard Mode will be released. 11-track album videos for Mr. Mina's got a video to shoot some more videos for a couple of the singles. There's some killer tracks on that album. We've, we've worked really hard on it. Um, we're hitting another coastal tour for Easter. Uh, heading down this coast again, east and west coast again, for the promotional tour of Hard Mode. And then, I really, I'm trying to get you, Lundy, to get us to Amsterdam. I have been forever because the Dutchies are crazy rock fans. Is it, is, it only, is it only for the fans that you want to go to Amsterdam? No, Amsterdam's <laughs> my place. <laughs> they have great coffee there. That's, yeah, that's great, right. I've heard that, coffee. Cito. You're mm. absolutely spot I've actually on. spent more time in Holland than I have in England. <laughs> love there it. Absolutely love it. And I think we're ready now. Like, 
28 years later, I think we're ready to, to take our music to the rest of the world. It's about time. Yeah. Do you see yourself heading to the UK at all? I see that's becoming increasingly, particularly that sort of eight, 90s SA, a lot of the bands going through there and going through into that sort of London space and then maybe up to Newcastle, Manchester, anything like that? We usually in the UK end up playing to expats. Yeah. So you spend a fortune going to the UK to play for South Africans. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's always on the cards. So it's definitely on the cards for our plans just to get out there and abroad and especially the UK. I mean, there's so many South Africans there and the kind of music that we do, I think, also suits the scene there. You know, Also the UAE. There's a lot of expats there. We're looking, at, we're looking at heading out there this year as well. Cool. Maybe some duo shows, maybe some Lovely full stuff. band shows. But there are some, some regions that we know we could just like tap into and, and hit quite well. England is a very difficult territory if, if you want to play to British people. Mm. If you want to play to South Africans, you go to London and you fill those shows with South Africans. Mm. Move outside of the, the M40 or whatever, that Watford Gap, and that's it. Not even in Leeds. Not even in Leeds. In Leeds, I could fill a club up with my family. (laughs) (laughs) It's a start, man. It's a start. 20 words or less from each about uh, streaming. You know, we can't, you can't fight it. You just have to embrace it and you have to work with it and you have to like adapt to the concept of just sharing your music. And that's where everybody's at. That's where everybody's listening to music. So, build a bridge, get over it, and find other ways to make money out of it. You know? In terms of the album and the release date that you've mentioned, is are you going to do this vinyl thing, which seems to be a big thing these days, and it's almost like compulsory? You might not do the CD anymore, but you'll do the vinyl, as well as the streaming? So, yeah, we do, we're doing um, all digital platforms and vinyl. We're not going to do CDs this time around. Cool. Um, there may be a tiny batch with uh, some very special covers, maybe some limited... I don't mean cover versions, I mean printed <laughs> covers. Um, but uh, vinyl definitely. Vinyl's, vinyl's definitely a thing. And I think with our kind of fan base, there's a lot of people who are vinyl heads. Uh, we see it at gigs because we have to sign them. So you actually, sure. you can physically sometimes count at the end of a night. You know, how many did you sign? You know, Just to, to end off on this CD versus vinyl versus streaming, I mean... Uh, before I came out, this I pulled out all my Wonder Boom CDs and I was going through. I, I've been looking at this wall of CDs and thinking, at what stage do you say, okay, you can take out those that are irreplaceable or collectors it's versus, it's you know, the yeah. AHA's greatest hits. You know, I suspect that'll be with us for a long time. But that whole thing of your point, Martin, of how long does this thing go on for? And at the stage where they say it's either too expensive or it's no longer available, sorry for you, because we the server just can't, I mean, the server will grow and grow. But that point at some stage where they say, we're taking it away from you. And you say, but I just got rid of, you know, 20,000 CDs or whatever it is. I think that's the thing that, that's my fear factor. That's why AHA Greatest Hits will stay, stay together with yeah. Wonderboom, with the U2s and all that. I, I think it's a big thing that. Like we assume that like all albums are going to be available streaming, but there's certain uh, albums and bands that I was looking for online that were just not on Spotify or whatever. And it's like, that's the one thing that I'm, I'm really hating about the streaming and copyright laws and all these things that, are, that they're trying to force onto like public domain and all that stuff now is that the devaluing of of the songs and and music in general you of know? the art right of I the, mean, art, of the itself. art itself of the and so like as long as we are a live band that's something that you could never sort of replicate or stream or take away like we keep those songs alive in that sense. And the know, energy that you guys have always brought. I mean, yeah. it's like... And, it's and a also in a studio, you can create anything. You don't have to be able to sing anymore. You don't have to be able to play well anymore. Live, there is nowhere to hide. You either can do it or you can't. Well, let's see tonight, shall we? <laughs> we'll see. Uh, can I have a nap first? <laughs> <laughs> to the two of you, enormous thanks for your time this afternoon. I know you've got to go and do your sound check and good luck for the show tonight. All the best for the album. And all the best for 2024, guys. Thank you so much. It's been really cool chatting and uh, you know, getting to know you all and share our story with you guys. Um, looking forward to Alma tonight. We'll see cool. what, what happens. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for indulging us. It's always nice that people are interested in what we have to say and listen to us, our music, and thank you. 
Thanks for your time. And some of the small rooms are sometimes better than the big rooms, so thank yeah. you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I definitely feel like it feels more intense, you know? Yeah. It's quite cool. Do you mind if we try our new single with you guys? It's like shaggy while you're camping. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking intense. <laughs> Good, I am shocked. I was very shocked. I've never used that before. Okay. You should have a go at comedy for sure. So next time you're camping and you're here. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's fucking intense. <laughs> Don't go camping in the next time. <laughs> You guys are all going to be camping, be like, oh no, it's going to adjust your perception forever. You can't unhear that shit, you know what I mean? <laughs> Woo! Okay, and now for the songs. <laughs> the new one? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's where we were, thanks. <laughs> Get your name, friend. Get your name, friend. 